All right. Well, I'm excited about offshore wind pri primarily because of all the potential we have. Um, this slide shows you the current projects that are off the Virginia project on the left. You'll see um, the coastal uh, Virginia offshore wind project um, that Dominion is establishing that goes online, um, starts construction in May, and it is online with its 2,600 meg um, 2,600 megawatts of power by the end of 2026. Um, we also have um, off the coast of North Carolina, uh, the Kitty Hawk project that Avon Grid is developing, that will come online into Virginia. Um, so real excited about that. That has, um, they have, Avon Grid has filed their construction operations plan. So um, haven't seen any timeline as far as um, when they are gonna be coming online with that power. Um, there's, uh, they are a little further behind than the Dominion project. So, but um, just a real opportunity for us in Virginia. Um, the uh, This fall, um, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is gonna have a, a Central Atlantic lease sale area. And you'll see on the left, those lease areas that they have um, um, identified and will be auctioning off. One of interest to us is area C in the orange. That is adjacent to the Dominion Sea Valve project. Um, and that one is, is a little bit larger than our current um, uh, area that we have. And Dominion is, is definitely interested in getting this one, picking it up. It is one that is um, that they are already referring to as Sea Valve 2. Um, obviously coming online. So um, really excited about all these opportunities, three projects, maybe even four. Um, there's an area that's adjacent to the Kitty Hawk project that um, is not identified for this um, this year's auction, but uh, Boehm is making commitments for 2025 lease sale auctions, made those commitments to Maryland, and hopefully we'll also make those commitments to, um, to um, North Carolina law as well. Um, and as you can see from that area, indicated by is area D, um, again, um, most likely coming online. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line, right? So um, a straight line into um, Virginia um, coming on with that power. And there, so there's a lot of potential um, just off the coast and, and it is giving us some excitement and want to increase the amount of offshore wind that's in um, our, um, as our goal um, to have uh, that public interest. Um, it's currently 5.2 gigawatts. Um, we could see it easily being eight megawatts. And it's not a matter of keeping up with the Joneses. You can see the, the targets um, and the goals that other states have, and some of them are mandates, some of them are just goals. But it's not just a matter of keeping up with the Joneses. I mean, we definitely need to keep up with Maryland. Um, as a minimum, because uh, they don't have nearly the amount of of, of shoreline or uh, projects potential as we do. And North Carolina, well, I can't say North Carolina, but definitely Maryland. But you can see we we really need to up our game on that. And there's a lot more than just keeping up with the Joneses as far as that's concerned. But um, you know, we give um, some um, certainty to developers and we uh, manufacturers that might want to locate in. Um, Hampton Roads need that certainty, and they also need a good, strong pipeline of projects. They're not going to get, you know, and develop, um, you know, multi-million dollar manufacturing facilities for just a just a handful of turbines out there. Um, they really want to have that strong pipeline of projects. So, um, having that certainty, having that commitment by Virginia to um, a higher goal to that eight gigawatts of power is uh, is. Um, is 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 really remarkable and something that we really want to strive for. Um, and it's also, you know, <laughs> and say nothing about climate and confronting climate. This is such a massive source of, of clean energy. And it's one that's there and available. So we need to maximize on that. So everything, you know, the campaign goals are really centered around what our goals are. Um, so with this opportunity of you know possibly eight gigawatts of power off of, we want to ensure that that's maximized. We want to maximize it both equitably and responsibly. Equitably means that it is it's beneficial to all Virginians. And most of the time that it, it that translates to jobs, um, job creation, the industry, the economic benefits that come along with equitable development of offshore wind and also responsible development that is properly cited 
um, turbines off the coast that um, are minimizing or mitigating any of the environmental impacts that might occur. And we, why do we want to do this? It's um, because, like I said, we're, we want to significantly confront that climate crisis and offshore wind does significantly confront it. Uh, we won't meet our clean energy goals, um, especially our expanded clean energy goals to eight gigawatts. We want to have that power available to replace um, the fossil fuel generation, especially gas plants and Peaker plants, which necessitate also compressor stations being built and pipelines being built. And, um, and we also want to provide all that economic opportunity, um, all those jobs, um, especially in the communities that um, need them most. So before we start diving into just what we have planned on the horizon, I just want to take a little step down uh, memory lane uh, because we've been at this for a really long time. Um, it was 2009 um, when the federal government, it was then Minerals Management Service, not BOEM as it is now, um, had a very first stakeholders meeting. This was in Williamsburg. And it was just to say, hey, y'all interested in offshore wind. Um, and um, that was, we all said a resounding yes. It was about two, 200 people at that meeting. I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, very exciting meeting. And uh, we all said yes. And so we started working with um, the federal government to make that happen. It wasn't until, took a lot of lobbying, a lot of cajoling, a lot of um, deconflicting, deconflict, um, deconfliction of the area to understand where we could go with this, identifying those areas, because we have a lot of conflicts out there, a lot of ocean uses with the um, military, with um, shipping, um, with fishing, and a number of other things and environmental concerns. And so the area was identified and then was actually leased off um, the commercial lease. I'm not touching so much on the um, the pilot project, which actually um, was a research lease. It's a little bit of a different process with, um, with um, BOEM. Um, that was a year later and it was actually awarded to the Commonwealth of Virginia for that area that the two pilot um, turbines stand on. But um, the big commercial lease, which is what we're all really happy about, um, was not one until it was one in 2013. And then you see a, a number of years again um, before Dominion actually committed to developing that. Um, there was a lot of um, speculation about why Dominion was doing that. Some folks felt that um, they had just bought up the lease to prevent anybody else from buying it up. Um, and Dominion was um, really going through a lot of um, exercises. They were um, uh, very concerned about bringing their case before the SEC and having um, the SEC not approve it. Um, so there was a lot of uh, workshops and a lot of um, talking to um, uh, European developers as well, um, just how to bring that cost in. What is the development model? Because you have to remember, this is brand new industry. This is, you know, not not been done before. So um, they, you know, they made that commitment, and it was kind of simultaneous to um, Governor Northam, then Governor Northam in 2019, having a Virginia Energy Plan that called for the 2,600 megawatts, and um, Dominion's response to that was. Um, and challenge accepted. And they had announced that they had actually filed with the um, um, SCC, this, the federal um, regulatory, or no, with FERC, no, not with FERC, um, with, oh shoot, what's the, the grid, um, with the grid operators to have it queued up, PJM. They had filed with PJM um, to have that 2,600 megawatt um, connected. So it was like, okay, game on. So, and then the next milestone is um, in 2020 um, when the Virginia Clean Economy Act passes. And this was actually one that put 5,200 megawatts in the public interest. Um, the uh, Dominion is committed to the 2,600. Um, it's a little nebulous as to if Dominion is committed necessarily to the additional 2,600 50, that make up that 52 or how that 52 actually comes on the line, but it is 5,200. Um, the interest in offshore wind, um, which we believe that Dominion's hoping to satisfy that um, with the sea valve one and the sea valve two, which they pick up at the Central Atlantic lease sale. I threw in 2021 in there just because that's when the pilot um, project 
um, became operational. And I'm throwing that on there because that was the first in the nation. We were first in the nation, a lot for Virginia to be proud of, um, with an offshore wind turbine, um, these two test turbines. It was very informative, lessons learned for Dominion on that. Um, in 2022, um, the SCC, the State Corporation Com uh, Commission, they approved CVAL, the commercial project. And uh, because Sierra, we intervened on this, um, we got some commitments from Dominion um, to diversity hiring for the CVAL project. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and then BOEM just recently, end of last year, approved the EIS for um, CVAL and the transmission construction had begun. And then um, early um, in 2024, I think it was in January, um, BOEM uh, finally approved the COP. So, and with that, um, Dominion is allowed to start construction. They'll start construction in May. So really, really, really exciting. Um, but every step, I'm bringing up this slide, you know, with a campaign plan overview um, uh, presentation because I just want to, reiterate how how long the history we have and how long of an activism hi history we've had. I mean, there had been at every step and every moving every milestone um, took a lot of activism. It took lobbying for the VCA passed passage. It took a lot of like um, lobbying again or you know pressuring um, Governor Northam to to step up and you know have a Virginia energy plan that was calling for um, and you know, calling for that 2600 from Dominion, uh, just a lot of steps in the way, um, even from the very get go to actually have um, BOEM um, uh, release that area off of Virginia and to make it work. So, so yeah, so 15 years, if you count back to 2019, that we as Sierra Club activists and our coalition partners, we have been there every step of the way. So, just a moment, everybody pat yourself on your back. <laughs> and I included this photo. This is one from 2012. It just really cracks me up. And, and I think it really speaks to the long history because it's 2020, 2012 is just seems like so, so long ago. But we had um uh we had a little coalition of folks at CKN Sierra Club and um a, a couple other groups. Um we delivered 10,000 petitions. It was a petition to Dominion saying. Um, build offshore wind, and it was 10,000 people, and we delivered and had a little press conference there. It was a lot of fun. So, um, yeah, just illustrative of just a long history of, of working on this. So looking forward to today's challenges with offshore wind. I'm sure a lot of folks have, because, um, I mean, we can't really do a plan in a vacuum. We have to be cognizant of of all the challenges, especially now there's um, delays in projects and cancellations of projects along the East Coast. So we have to look at those pro those challenges and assess those, those um, challenges moving forward. COVID in the Ukraine uh, had cost of steel going up, um, interest rates going up, supply chain issues, um, a long development process as well, um, great time lags between the power purchase agreements and then the final investment decisions. Um, permanent delays, like I said, and a lot of uncertainty. And, and a lot of it's just natural growing pains of a brand new industry. This is a frontier industry. Um, you know, United States hasn't done this before. Um, so there's inevitably always some growing pains that are going to go in. And then recently, there's been a lot of disinformation, a lot of um, fossil fuel um, backed organizations um, are are funding a lot of disinformation, um, you know, alleging that whales are killed by um, wind turbines and, and that kind of thing. But for us in Virginia, with the CFAL project being on time and on budget, and everyone really gearing up for um, a really robust Central Atlantic seal, sale for the uh, Central Atlantic. Um, and our biggest challenge is right now is that too few people um, know about offshore wind. Um, that is um, something that shows up in a lot of polling that we have had had done. Um, we had some recent polling done. Um, Sierra Club had commissioned um, some polling. Thank you, Energy Foundation, for underwriting that. But um, it had found that um, there's Virginians are, are react very favorably um, to offshore wind. Uh, 
you'll see that's that's 54 percent um support offshore wind which is you know it's not like i think there was new jersey poll that had like 80 something percent which really kind of like i i wouldn't want 80 percent i'd rather a 54 percent. i'd rather a majority a small majority like that or not you know overwhelming majority because that's to me it seems you know it may be on the conservative side but I'd rather be on the conservative side and and still have to work for that, um, work to increase that, you know, bump it up to so that's more sincere, if that makes sense. 19% of, of the population in Virginia is not sure. And, and that's something that we, you know, obviously want to um, fix. And uh, just completely ignore the unfavorables. Um, that is just not worth. They, these are folks that are buying into the misinformation, and it's you know we have a lot of work with you know trying to gin up the uh, favorables and also to um, flip the um, the on the fencers, the fence sitters that you know just priorities. You know you could you can talk your ear off um, and never convince some of the unfavorables because if they're going to believe the, the nonsense, then they're going to believe the nonsense no matter what you do. Um, and we also have a winning message. Um, some of the polls, um, also there was a poll connect, conducted recently by Climate Nexus and Turn Forward and just what the messages are. And they are ones that really resonate, resonate um, or the ones that we can really get behind um, the reliability um, issues. Um, energy independence are is a top, um, and that's a very bipartisan message that um, has appeal um, on a bipartisan level. Um, and, and the one that's been a long time uh, winning message is the economic benefits. Um, we in Virginia are really um, have a, an ideal location for a lot of that manufacturing, a lot of that um, to come and be based and be a, a mid-Atlantic hub for offshore wind, which have so many advantages. Um, I could go on and on. I think you all know those talking points, you know, with our, our port and our shipbuilding industry here in the first place. And just a lot of a lot of positives are concerned um, that make it a natural hub for um, offshore wind and thus all the job creation that can come from it. And it's also, like I said at the top, a massive amount of, of energy, clean energy coming online that really helps us to confront the climate the climate uh, crisis. So let's just quickly review before we go forward. Um, what do we want? Uh, we want to maximize the equitable and responsible development of offshore wind um, off Virginia's coast. And why do we want to do this? Well, to significantly confront the climate crisis and to meet our clean energy goals, um, reduce or replace any of that fossil fuel generation and provide the, the economic opportunities, i.e. jobs um, for the communities that need it most. And just to re-review uh, what we have going for us, uh, we have a long track record of offshore wind activism. We have a good size base. We have that 54% of folks who support us and uh, we have a lot of milestones um, this year. Um, we have not only the construction on Seabow starting this year, which hopefully will get a lot of press, and we also have the uh, lease sale. Um, we're just very lucky with a lot of milestones that we can get really excited that are gonna be helping um, amplify um, um, our, our campaign. And uh, we have the winning message. Um, we have the, all that economic benefit that can come here um, and the reliability argument and the confronting climate. So we have um, a really a winning message on that. So we have a lot going for us. So a lot to build on. So how do we do this? And this is something that Sierra Club is is really, really, really good at. I mean, we are um, as an as an organizing um, as an organizing organization, <laughs> uh, we are good at movement building, and we are uh, great at organizing and working with our um, grassroots to effect change to build those movements. We have the um, great capacities and the skills to really um, work on supporter bases. And um, you know, really uh, concentrate on on building those, um, and then also capturing the support of our our fences sitters. We have done this 
historically, um, and we uh, do it well. Um, so we have that advantage going for us too. And then we also, because we're a volunteer-based organization, um, we have the capacity to dig deep. Um, we have a great strength with our volunteers. So uh, yeah, so I have put here a little picture. This is our offshore wind team. Uh, we had headed out to, um, to tour, um, or some of the members of our offshore wind team um, that um, tour the Seabound project. And we also want to have a lot of fun doing it. Um, so with the goal of of just um, with the, the challenge of that there are too few people that know about offshore wind, um, this campaign is really, this year is really built around visibility. And the best way to have some visibility is getting out there and doing some events. So we have a lot of events um, that we've done in the past that we want to do again, um, hopefully this year. Um, we want to have, um, we've had large offshore wind town halls. We had one at um, ODU a few years ago, 300 people at. Um, we had one at Hampton University. It was 200 people on that one. Um, want to re-engage that way and have those kinds of large events. We are definitely planning on Global Wind Day, which um, happens to fall on a Saturday. It's just a big fun, we've done them before, big fun event. Um, kite flying, you know, painting, face painting, kids, um, turbines on kids' faces, that kind of thing. Um, yeah, and then we also want to do a lot more tabling. We're already signed up to do tabling at um, Virginia Beach Earth Day. Um, there's 20,000 people that come through there, so we want to have a big uh, presence there um, as much as possible. Other communities that have Earth Day events or any farmers markets, we want to get out there and um, any of the um, community festivals that are occurring, we want to have the opportunity to um, table and talk to folks about offshore wind and um, and transitioning away from fossil fuels. And there's also the opportunity with socials. This is one that um, we've done very effectively in the past, you know, participated at Green Drinks, um, helping to drive the agenda on that one, uh, Green Drinks Virginia Beach. I know that they have enough uh, one coming up, but it would be great in Hampton Roads if we had uh, green drinks um, scheduled in, in a variety of cities. And um, So Eileen, um, green drinks, pretty Chesapeake, pretty green drink, green drinks, Chesapeake just started up again. Okay, great. For things to know. If you could hold your comments or questions till the end, because we are recording. And offshore wind presentations to civic groups um, and um, uh, groups, um, any kind of any group um, I'm presenting to the Kiwanis, for instance, um, that kind of thing, I'm getting out there, holding rallies. Um, we're not necessarily going to do hands across the sand again, but that has been one that's been big and effective. We've talked about um, uh, windmills, not oil spills in that context of, of fighting offshore drilling and saying, hey, we want wind turbines off our coast, not um, oil rigs. Um, pressers ahead, there'll be a number of public comment opportunities. Um, whether or not they're live, um, they've, uh, BOEM has shifted to virtual public comment meetings, but if there's ever an opportunity to uh, to stand up, um, you know, at a uh, at event that any um, elected official is having or any agency is having to have those pressers ahead of time and then have rallies associated with those. So those are a lot of the events that we really want to um, re-engage, um, expand, um, get involved with, because like I said, it, um, there's really, the, this this campaign is really about grassroots. It's about um, visibility. It's about engaging new people um, and getting into the community and talking, to, talking up wind. So um, in trying to enlist our activists, um, a, the best volunteer recruitment advice I ever got is to talk to people about what they're good at. So um, do a self-assessment. Um, if you want to get engaged as an activist within our offshore wind campaign or any campaign, really, for that matter, um, just to assess what you're good at. Um, like a social butterfly. That's, I am a social butterfly. I love getting out there and talking to people. So I, as somebody who has that proclivity, um, 
I enjoy tabling. I enjoy si signing up and spending a couple hours talking to folks about um, an issue. Um, I also um, enjoy, um, even if it's just a two minute spiel, going to a green drinks and socializing, you know, just say, hey, this is what I'm up to and socializing with people that way. So um, there's an opportunity for um, folks um, to uh, not only attend you know, the green drinks or the social events, but um, also to sign up for tables and and, and find out if um, if there's a tabling opportunity that you learn about and you're just like, oh, we should be there, um, like a farmer's market or anything along those lines. Um, just take it upon yourself to get set up and, and talk to folks about it. Um, writing, um, we have a really great letter to the editor team. Um, if you if those are the kinds of things that you like to do, um, writing sometimes involves a little bit of some research as well. Um, you know, being uh, up on an issue, um, it's not necessarily yourself submitting a letter. It could be you write a letter or write talking points, and somebody else submits it, um, or um, you help. Um, um, yeah, just with that, um, lobbying is another big, powerful thing. If you're somebody who really likes to to um, talk to elected officials or talk to um, candidates, um, that is one that, that again plays into Sierra Club's strengths. Um, one of the things that I like best about um, Sierra Club is that we are a political organization. We do have um, we do make endorsements in political races. And and absolutely, it, that's all, all volunteer driven. We have political volunteer political teams, um, and uh, they are you know in in making those endorsements of candidates. They're they're insisting that you know that that candidates um, answer questionnaires and and ensuring that um, offshore wind and clean energy and transitioning off fossil fuels are questions that are bubbling up and are are being you know opposed to all of the candidates. Um, so that's a, a really great opportunity for anybody. Uh, and also, you know, meeting with your legislators, meeting with your elected officials. Um, that's um, something that um, a lot of people enjoy doing. Um, I know I do. Then, then also promotion. This one is, is really, really important. And then this one has um, a certain, it has a level of just, you know, of such huge variety. It could be just simply sharing on social media, sharing on 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 Twitter, sharing on Facebook, um, a post um, or an event that's coming up or an action alert, um, to you know, um, posting it on next door to your neighborhood, um, just and then just promotion, lots and lots and lots of ways. The rule of seven, I put that little note in there. Um, I do believe very heartily in the rule of seven. If we're planning a big offshore wind. Um, town hall to get a good collection of people there, good um, attendance level on there. Those folks have will need to have heard about it seven times in seven different ways that they've heard about it. It's on social, they got an email, they got a text message, they got a phone call. They Seven different times that that message has been presented to them in order for it to register and have them actually show up. So um, it's really important that we're, you know, we're, you know, just like that shampoo commercial is like I told someone and then she told someone and the next thing it's month like that. That's that really goes back to the um, the rule of seven. So um, really adhere to that. So that is it. Um, thank you so much. Um, I do want to talk to you. Um, please email me um, and I would love to talk to you about you know, what you think your talents and strengths are, what your time commitments are, and um, we'll come up with something, some way that you can be involved, um, um, big or small, um, and in our offshore wind campaign and our Sierra Club campaigns in general, and welcome to uh, uh, have a do meeting over the phone or um, meeting over coffee, or if, um, you want to e-introduce me to somebody, introduce me to somebody that you think um, might um, be very interested in volunteering this way too. But um, yeah, so that is it. Thank you so much. And I'm going to stop recording and we'll take questions.